According to Christian eschatology, the Antichrist is a person prophesied by the Bible to oppose Christ and substitute himself in Christ's place. This is a personality, entity or a being energized by Satan himself to imitate everything Christ ever represents in strength, power, relevance, signs and wonders and many more. God has his son Jesus and Satan will have his son the Antichrist. Not exactly in the same way as God has his son because Jesus is God incarnate but the devil will have his own version of Jesus. The Antichrist is announced in the Bible as the one who denies the Father and the Son. 1 John 2 verse 22 Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. The Antichrist is a being that is in open opposition with God and his purposes. In a literal sense, we can say he is the enemy of God. However, as established in the Bible, his season and time of manifestation are in the last days. In Christian eschatology, there are several events that are associated with the last days. So many happenings and events ranging from the pouring out of God's Spirit upon all flesh in Joel 2 verse 28 to the emergency of false prophets deceiving many in Matthew. To iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. However, the emergence of the Antichrist seems to be a major event among others. The objective of the Antichrist is to antagonize Christ and his teachings, as his name implies, Antichrist, as well as to substitute himself in place of Christ. Now for us to truly understand the arrival of the Antichrist that is spoken of in the Bible, let us start again at the very beginning of his story. God is the creator of everything. At some point, God created a wonderful species called angels. Within these beings, there are different ranks and orders, and among one of the most highly ranked angels, one was called Lucifer, a magnificent being. The prophet Ezekiel described him as the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Every precious stone was his covering. He was the anointed cherub who covers. He was perfect in his ways from the day he was created. Lucifer was fully arrayed by the Creator to reflect his glory until one day when everything changed. Lucifer became so impressed with his own beauty, intelligence, power and position that he began to desire for himself the honor and glory that belonged to God alone. Pride caused him to be driven away from heaven with some host of angels alongside who are now regarded as fallen angels. He lost his glory and beauty, his prowess got corrupted, rendering him unfit for the master's use. Ever since the devil fell, he has been in constant enmity with God and his people. He has been striving to win the heart of God's people over to himself via different means. 
The devil carried out his first and major plan when he struck in the Garden of Eden by tempting Adam and Eve. Humanity fell as a result of the temptation in Eden and there was a gap between God and man. However, God's love and mercy were lavishly poured out again on humankind at Christ's birth. Christ's death much more expressed God's indefinite love as he sacrificed his only son for the restoration of man. As a result of the victory that the death and resurrection of Christ gave to man, the devil is still in the business of deceiving many people today. For many that will not yield to the truth of God's word will be fooled by the devil. In a bid to buy back the human heart to him, the devil is so much more interested in imitating God and his son Jesus. He tries different means. Specifically, the Bible makes us understand, according to St. John, what the end of time will look like. The entire summation of the devil's hatred and disgust for God will reach a peak where the devil will have to make his last stand against God and his son. According to the Bible, this mission will be fulfilled by a personality, a man, person called the Antichrist, Satan, in desperation will present to the world a figure that will openly oppose the standards of God and his Son. The Antichrist aims at flaunting his own strength and prowess. He is a false peace, the wicked one, the son of perdition. He can be likened to the son of the devil. The phrase false Christ found in the Gospels in Matthew chapter 24 and Mark chapter 13, explains the warning of Jesus to his disciples not to be deceived by the false prophets, who will claim themselves as being Christ, performing great signs and wonders. Two other images often associated with the Antichrist are the little horn in Daniel's final version and the man of sin in Apostle Paul's second epistle to the Thessalonians. The Antichrist will show forth great intelligence, skill and signs, such that it would be easy to deceive anyone who is not rooted in the truth of the word of God. Obviously, there is lots of law about the Antichrist that is not precisely accurate. Based on doctrinal beliefs, human interactions and mindsets, the misconception of who or what Antichrist is, is big. Many believers today misinterpret the Antichrist for a spirit or some supernatural powers. As a matter of fact, there are lots of beasts, dragons, harlots, demons and satanic legions spoken about in the Bible, but they are not the Antichrist. The epistles of John gave us a clear picture of who the Antichrist is and what he is not. 1 John 2 verse 22 who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. The Antichrist is a man just like you and me. He has eyes, ears and hands all orchestrated by the devil. He is not an idea or a philosophy but rather a human being, a normal human being. His eyes won't glow red, 
He won't be red like the devil. He will be a very charming, charismatic man. The Antichrist is also not the devil as some folks think or a political system. He is a person that is intelligently empowered by the devil. His entire being is demonically created by the devil. His words, actions and strategies are all equipped by the devil and in essence he is demonic. The Antichrist is associated with deceit, fake miracles and signs, false messages of peace and wickedness, like the Bible explained, many false prophets would arise carrying the spirit of the Antichrist, exhibiting many signs and wonders and, as a result, leading many in the paths of unrighteousness. Nevertheless, all these false prophets are still not the Antichrist. Understanding this fundamental truth will enable believers to watch and pray earnestly. Make sure you subscribe to the new Line of Judah Prayer channel. Click the link in the description. The real reason why a lot of people will take the mark of the beast. Revelation 13, 16 and 17, King James Version and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. You know, when reading the book of Revelation, we read about the mark of the beast, and that people will worship the beast, and we automatically think that these signs will all happen overnight. But the truth is that it won't happen overnight. The spirit of the Antichrist is already at work. The God of this world is already at work. And that is what the Bible tells us. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. 1 John 4, 3 But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. If you ask anyone around now, that if the Antichrist comes back with the mark of the beast, or if the time for the mark of the beast comes, will they receive the mark? The answer you will hear from most people is no. We know what the mark signifies, we know what it means, and we know where it is coming from. So I always used to ask myself, why on earth will anyone take the mark? Because it doesn't make sense to me. Why would anyone take it? How will the Antichrist and the devil plan out their recruitment for their mark? What approach will they use to get people to accept the mark? There are two major ways the devil will do this, and we will explain the two ways and how they are working in the world today. The two major ways are deception and idolatry. These are the plans of the devil to make people collect the mark of the beast. Now, how are these things playing out today? Let's look at deception. The first approach of the devil on any occasion is deception. There is a reason why Jesus called this being the father of lies. We know about technologies and those who invented them. Satan invented lies and deceit. John 8:44, King James Version. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your family ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own words, for he is a liar, and the father of it. 
One of the primary tactics of the devil is deceit. In the Garden of Eden, he used deceit. He tried it on Jesus, but failed. He will, and he is, using the same method today in the world. When the Antichrist comes and takes center stage, he won't come with red eyes and horns poking out of his head. He will come as a man of peace. He will deceive the world into believing that he is the solution to all the world's problems. And that is the deception he will come with. He won't let his true intention be known initially. The world will trust him, exalt him, uplifting him. The kind of approach he will come with will make people worship him. He will do things that others cannot do. He will bring solutions that others cannot. He will bring peace where others have failed. 2 Thessalonians 2 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God. The Antichrist will speak evil against God. He will say many bad things about God just to deceive people so that they can worship Him. The Antichrist will shift the focus of people from God to Himself. Revelation 13 verse 1 to 10 And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given over all kindreds, and tongues, and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. He will look wonderful, be charming and successful. He will be energized by the very power of hell. You have never seen such demonic charisma. He will deceive people. He will deceive nations. He will deceive millions. He will be demonically energized. Millions will worship him. He will be an emblem of reconciliation. He will be a symbol of peace, a beacon of hope a path to utopia, a guiding light full of false promises. He will look like the solution and appear as an angel of light. He will come like a sheep, but he is a wolf. He will come like a lamb, but he is a dragon. He will come with no corruption, but he is full of corruption. The devil has real power. However, his power is nowhere near to the power of God. But nevertheless, he is a powerful being that should not be underestimated. After all, he is formally one of God's highest angels and has the power to deceive and to emulate miracles. The second is material things. 
The devil will offer many people material things. Tell me, who doesn't want to have a good life? Is there anyone on earth who would not want to become a billionaire? The devil knows this, and he will use the material things that will not last to deceive people into following the wrong path. Revelation 13, 16, and 17 And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Without the mark, people will not be able to buy or sell. This is one of the reasons why people will take the mark. Moving on to idolatry. The second method is idolatry, and this will come after people have been deceived. This is when you will see people worshipping other people. The Antichrist will be an idol, a celebrity when he comes. This man will be loved. He will be utterly adored by the world. Now I want to ask you a question. Don't you think the world is ready for him? We often sit in front of the television and watch movies. We watch sports. We see many things on the television and we love them. There are some musicians that we love. There are many sports people that we love. I am not saying that we should hate them. It is not bad to love the sport or the sports people. But it has gotten to a point where many people worship these artists or these athletes. There are basketball players that people bow to when they slam dunk. There are soccer players that people or the fans always bow to when they score. These things leave you wondering how have we gotten to this stage in the world. People now worship other human beings. You see concerts full of tens of thousands of people chanting a person's name, exalting that person, uplifting that person, literally thousands of people screaming someone's name. You say that that is not worship? Yes, it is. Look at the lyrics of a song we sing in praise and worship. For example, look at that song. Let your living water flow. Jesus, 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 sing to the Father, 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 Father. A song exalting the name of Jesus, but now you see people exalting other humans. It is idolatry. You see celebrities walking on the street and people are literally fainting at the sight of them. 2,000 years ago, idols were graven images and massive statues that people would bow down to and worship. But the devil moves with the time. We are now too sophisticated to be bowing down at some wooden statue. So modern day idols for us are celebrities. You should never sleep as a Christian. You shouldn't think that the plan of the man of sin will come only after the rapture or sometime later in life. John shared the revelation coming from the sea and the beast coming from the land. In 2 Thessalonians 2, the Bible was talking about a particular man called the man of sin. He was also called the son of perdition. The Bible says that this man will come in the last days. He will start to be operational in the last days. We need to get this clear so that we will have an understanding of when this man of sin will appear. Verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. This man will be revealed to the world. Everyone will see this man in action. What will this man of sin do? Verse 4 continued, Who opposeth 
and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God. Now we have seen that he has the same attributes of the beast that was mentioned in the book of Revelation 13. This man will speak blasphemy. He will position himself as God so that people will be able to worship him. When will this man start his work? When will people start working for him? Is it after the coming of Christ or now? 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7 gave us the time when this man of sin will start his work. The NIV says, For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. We must be truthful to ourselves. The spirit of the Antichrist is already amongst us. He is already working, and we are not seeing it. Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 through 17 of the King James Version says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. There is a great mystery that surrounds the mystical number 666. And this isn't a mystery that came into light only recently, but even in the ancient world. Scholars have endeavored to find out who the mystery man is behind this number. The truth is, till this day, no one knows definitively the meaning of this number or the name of the person behind this number. Greek and Hebrew and Bible scholars over the centuries have been attempting for centuries to unravel the mystery of this name and number. The truth is that if you look at this number long enough and hard enough, this number 666 fit into any name. Although we don't know exactly who the man behind this number is, what we do know about the people alive during this time in the book of Revelation chapter 13, they will undoubtedly know who he is and what the number represents. Now, if we were to ask the majority of people right now if the Antichrist comes with the mark of the beast, or if the time for the mark of the beast comes, will they take the mark? The answer you will hear from most people is no. But the Bible reveals to us that people will indeed take the mark. And there are a number of different reasons why people will take the mark. And within this sermon, we will explore the reasons why. How do you think the devil will place the mark? What approach do you think he will use to get people to collect it? If we want to look at the approach of the devil, we will have to start with the world today. You know, many of us will hear of the mark of the beast, or the fact that people will worship the beast, and what we think is that it will all happen in the distant future, years from now, centuries from now. But that's not true. I would go as far as saying it has already started, but people don't see it yet. We might have not been seeing the mark on people around the world, but are we not seeing what the mark signifies in the world now? The significance of the mark is in the world today, and we are turning a blind eye to it. There are three major ways the devil will do this, and we will expand on the three ways and how they are working in the world today. The three major ways are coercion, deception, and idolatry. Two of these reasons are interlocked together. Idolatry is dependent on deception. No one will go into idolatry except they have been deceived by someone or something. These are the plans of the devil to make people collect the mark. Number one, coercion. Revelation chapter 13 verses 16 through 17 of the King James Version says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. The second beast, who is known as the false prophet, will ensure that people will have to take the mark, because without it, 
an individual will not be able to buy or sell. Now think of the pressure that this will put people under. Imagine the strain that this will put on the father of a family, knowing that he cannot provide for his family unless he takes this mark. Look at the lengths people go to in order to have money in their pocket. People go as far as doing illegal activities such as armed robbery because they don't have money. All this father needs to do is take the mark, and then he can buy and sell again. He will try to hold out, but when he sees a loved one struggling, he will give in. Think of a single mother who is alone and has to look after her kids. She may even know her eternal destiny will be sealed by her taking the mark, but she will still go ahead and do it. Rather than focusing on their eternity, people will focus on the here and the now. Don't you think that is what people do already? People focus on the here and the now. But the Bible reminds us constantly that there is an eternity. And that is what people should focus on. Our decision should be based on eternity. The second reason is deception. The first approach of the devil on any occasion is deception. There is a reason why Jesus called this being the father of lies. We know about technology and those who invented the technology. Satan invented lies and deceit. John chapter 8 verse 44 of the King James Version says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. Satan is the founding father of lies. If you look at the history of destruction of Satan, his method of choice has included deceit to some extent. Check anything Satan destroyed, he used deceit. In the Garden of Eden, he used deceit. He tried it on Jesus, but failed. He will, and he is, using the same method today in the world. Maybe you are thinking that the devil will come at the end of the world and start to deceive many people, or start telling them lies about his original appearance. In Revelation 13, there are two beasts. The first beast is the Antichrist, and the second beast is the false prophet. The false prophet endorses the Antichrist to the world and urges the world to worship the first beast. Now look at what the false prophet does. Revelation chapter 13, verse 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He will deceive those on the earth to take the mark. The means of his deception will be through signs and wonders. People will see these wonders and will marvel at the false prophet and will listen to him as he directs worship to the Antichrist. Jesus said that in the end times, false prophets would emerge and show great signs and wonders to deceive many. Matthew chapter 24 verse 24 says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. We all know that Revelation 14 details to us that three angels will be sent by God to preach the gospel, but this deception is so powerful that even though people will see angels flying and warning them not to take the mark, some will still go ahead and take them. We see this in Revelation 14. In the book of Revelation, John was able to record the prophecy of three angels The prophecies of those angels are recorded in Revelations 14, verse 6 to 16, and they are to be taken into cognizance so that we can be at watch. Here we have one of the most awesome scenes in the history of mankind. Angels will be seen by everyone, everyone on earth, in the corners of all the world, Angels will be seen literally flying, preaching unto men. What a sight! What a moment! We don't know the identity of these angels, but they are coming. People will be sitting in their homes looking out of their windows and see these angels. 
People will be driving in the most remote locations of the world and will see and hear these angels. People will be in the middle of the sea, but they will see the angels and hear the gospel. God will give the choice to all humanity to accept the gospel. God will warn humanity. God will plead with humanity and that is what these angels will do. Warning humanity, pleading humanity to make the right choice. He is a God that cares. The wonderful thing is that as I am preaching this message, we are getting closer to the arrival of these angels. Every second, every minute, every hour, every day brings us closer to their arrival. Even though the gospel will be preached by the 144,000 and the three angels and the two witnesses, the God of this world will still be at work doing what the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, which says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And number three, idolatry. The third method is idolatry. After the deception has set in, the first beast will be an idol. He will be loved and adored. Although he is energized by the very power of hell, he is still a man, and people will worship him. The Antichrist's demand for worship will be so extreme, he will set himself up as God. A man will be worshipped. People think this is so far-fetched. But the people of this world already practice worshipping people now. Look at the culture of celebrities, where people place other human beings on a pedestal. Where people faint when they see another person. Where people scream hysterically when they meet another person. I have even seen people bowing and worshipping a celebrity. This culture has even infiltrated the church. Celebrity pastors are becoming more prominent. People are to love their pastor, but not to worship them. I love my pastor, but I don't worship him. I look after my pastor, but I don't worship him. In all honesty, we live in a culture of idols. Idolatry is whatever you worship. Whatever you put first in your life is an idol. Idolatry will come in when you have been deceived. When you are an idolater, be clear of this. You are not a child of God. I will repeat that. If you are an idolater, you are not a child of God. Don't say you are being judged or you are being condemned. This is not the time to be thinking someone is condemning you. This is a warning, and it is nothing compared to the eternal damnation that will come to every idolater. You may be saying that you are not an idolater, but you love money more than God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 of the King James Version says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. We also have it in Luke chapter 16, verse 13 of the King James Version that no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You must love one and hate the other. You cannot love money more than God and say, you love God. The Antichrist will be idolized, loved, and adored. Some people take the mark because of this, because he is their idol. There is a man coming who will be the Antichrist himself. He will be loved and adored. He will be revered and respected. He will walk on this earth and claim to be God Almighty. He will come and claim and demand to be worshipped. And he will be worshipped by man as if he is God Almighty. He will blaspheme God. He will display miraculous powers. The world will embrace him. The world will love him and worship him. I don't know if he's arrived on this earth yet, but what I do know is that his spirit is here already, alive and well. 
just as the Spirit of God is here on earth and is doing the work of the Lord God Almighty. The Spirit of the Antichrist is here on earth preparing the hearts of men for his coming, preparing the hearts of men for his arrival. 1 John 4, 2, 3 Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world. Now the number one target of the spirit of the Antichrist is Christians. Those who are in the world will accept the Antichrist when he comes. Those who are in the world will worship him when he comes. But those who won't are those who are believers in Jesus Christ. Therefore, obviously, one of the primary agendas of the Antichrist is to prepare Christians and churches all around the world to accept him, welcome him, and worship him when he comes. As believers, we need to be wiser than the devil's tactics and strategies so that we won't give room for the Antichrist amidst this world. Obviously, we can say that the Antichrist is in rivalry with the person of Christ and his main targets are the children of God. Without a doubt, you will agree that the Antichrist has started operation in the world already. His activities of deception through false prophets and teachers are gaining ground by the day. And this is not just happening amongst non-believers in the world. It has as well crept into the Church of God. I could go as far as saying that the spirit of the Antichrist that is spoken of in 1 John 4, 2-3 is actively out in the world planting churches. All across the world right now, the spirit of the Antichrist is building and establishing churches. And within these churches, being established by the spirit of the Antichrist, there are four core observations I have noted. I honestly believe that these four beliefs will lead thousands of people to take the mark when it comes. It will lead thousands to welcome the man of sin. What are the signs to know that the Antichrist is functioning in your church? There are four major signs to know that your church has the Antichrist spirit in it. The first and most obvious sign is, the church does not acknowledge Jesus as God. The first sign to know that the spirit of the Antichrist is functional in a church is their failure to acknowledge Jesus as God. Let's see what the Bible says about this in 1 John 4, 3. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and is now already in the world. This scripture points out clearly that the denial of the person of Christ is a function of the spirit of Antichrist. The Jesus of this Bible is God. You cannot avoid him. The truth be told, the devil doesn't care at all if you know Jesus or love Jesus or pray to Jesus, as long as it is a false Jesus, a make-believe Jesus, a Jesus who is not there and who therefore cannot save. The Jesus of this Bible is God. You can't avoid him. You cannot deny him. Jesus is God. Do you know what this tells me? It tells me that you have to do business with Jesus. So many churches now believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but he himself is not God. But that belief is incorrect. Jesus is the Son of God, and he is also God himself. But so many people try to say that this does not make sense to me. I don't completely understand how that can be. The truth is, you will never fully understand God. God is beyond my little mind. God is beyond your intellect. Your intellect is limited. You are limited to this world. You are limited to oxygen. You are limited to time. But God is beyond all these things. You cannot comprehend God. Too often people want to demote Jesus Christ to a glorified man. Too often people want to demote Jesus Christ to a glorified prophet. But this Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is God. We want to make Jesus Christ a little above us where we can still control him because we can understand him. But Jesus Christ is beyond your understanding. The Bible tells us multiple times Jesus Christ is God. Look at the name God the Father gave to Jesus Christ. The name is Emmanuel. Matthew 1.23 Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is, 
God with us. The Bible did not say Emmanuel is interpreted as the Son of God with us. No, no, no. The Bible said God with us. Jesus Christ is God. Only the spirit of the Antichrist tries to remove the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ claimed to be God. John 8.58 Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And finally, Jesus Christ accepted worship as God. John 20.28-29 20, Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Notice that Jesus did not rebuke Thomas, but he accepted the worship because Jesus Christ is God. Nowadays, we have a lot of churchgoers who don't believe in Christ as the Son of God. Neither do they believe in his second coming, yet they go to church. 1 John 4.3 makes it clear that such a belief can only be birthed by the spirit of the Antichrist. It doesn't matter how well anyone participates in church projects and activities, inasmuch as they don't acknowledge that Christ is God, they have the spirit of Antichrist working in them. If you notice that you are demoting Jesus Christ to the level of a man, watch out. The spirit of the Antichrist may be enticing you. The second sign is discrediting the Bible. 2 Peter 2.1 But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. To discredit the word of God means to kick out against God's doctrine. Teachers of strange doctrines are agents of the spirit of the Antichrist who kick against God's word. When such teachers come secretly, bringing their teachings, condemning the truth of the word of God, you already know, beware. And this is why you must know the word of God for yourself. We all have the Bible, which is the word of God, at our disposal. Everything we need to guard and fight for our faith is inside it. Let no one deceive you. Watch out for false doctrines. That attempt to discredit the Bible. The third sign is that your church embraces and supports sin. Embracing and supporting sin is another sign to know that the spirit of the Antichrist is gaining ground in your church and in your life. In recent times, a lot of churches spread their arms wide open to receive all manner of strange doctrines and patterns to suit the world. Remember what the Word of God says about friendship with the world. Friendliness with the world will forever mean hostility with God because the ways of sin are not the ways of God. When we spread our arms wide open as a church to embrace sin, what we say is that sin is reigning in our mortal bodies. As believers, we're meant to war against sin and everything that has to do with it. Supporting sin means trivializing the sacrifice of Christ, which God will never take lightly with anyone. When I say this, I am not referring to ungodly discrimination that scares non-believers away. I'm talking about taking our stand as God's children and doing the right thing, regardless of what people think or say about us. Many pastors today feel shy and awkward to tell their members about the truth of the Word of God in a bid to look progressive. Some even intentionally refuse to instruct or correct people the way they should do because of the fear of not being blessed with money and material things by their members. All these are signs of the Antichrist. The act of supporting or embracing sin is not only applicable to the church. It also has to do with the home and family as a unit. When parents fail to teach their children the way of the Lord, the children will definitely prefer to embrace sin than to follow the Lord. This is a symbol of the end times and a sign of the Antichrist as seen in 2 Timothy 3, 1-2. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. The fourth sign is, your church is shaped by society and the culture of this world. 
Another dangerous sign that the spirit of the Antichrist is at work in your church is the tendency to shape your church according to the pattern of the society and the culture of the world. The Bible tells us who the God of this world is. That is the devil who sponsors the spirit of the Antichrist. 2 Corinthians 6, 14-18 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers? For what fellowship hath righteousness and unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Each time you choose to align with the way of the world at the expense of God's will, you are boosting the ego and authority of the spirit of the Antichrist. The God of this world is an enmity of God our Father. As believers, we must come to the conscious and complete agreement that the world has its way of doing things, which is in everlasting opposing the way of God. No matter how you try to rebrand it, the practice of the world is sin, pleasure, and flesh, while the course of the Lord is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Those two ways have nothing in common and can never blend because God will never lower his standards to the standards of the world. Neither will the world succumb to the way of the Lord as well. When you see your church agree more and more and more with the world, it is a sign that the spirit of the Antichrist is coming into your church. There are some signs that the spirit of the Antichrist is moving into your life personally, one of which is an unwillingness to hear the truth of the gospel. This is another sign of the presence of the spirit of the Antichrist, which is associated with the end times. 2 Timothy 4, 3-4 tells us clearly that, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. According to this scripture, we understand that a time will come when people will no longer endure sound doctrines. In other words, the truth of the Word of God and the Gospel of Christ will be too demanding for people to cope. People will rather hear sermons on making money rather than hell and repentance, resulting in a watered-down gospel. Can you take the mark of the beast accidentally? I received an email asking this question. Can you take the mark of the beast accidentally? To answer this question, let us look at biblical prophecy. The prophets of old, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, detailed to us events that will occur leading up to the second coming of Jesus. The rising of false prophets, nations waging wars against one another, the love of the believers waxing cold, and the deceiving of many believers are all end-time events that the prophets of old have prophesied about. But today, we're going to look at a prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled. Jesus said in the book of Matthew 24, 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Mark 13, 10 also confirms this truth. Mark 13, 10 says, and the gospel must first be published among all nations. These two scriptures stated plainly that the Lord Jesus would not appear until the gospel is preached all over the nations of the earth. Therefore, the gospel will be preached in all tongues, kindred, tribes, and countries of the world, no exception. Everyone in every tribe, family, and language will have the opportunity to accept Christ or reject him. The ISO country codes standards details that we have more than 240 countries in the world with their states and capitals. A bulk of these countries have a population as big as over 100 million in them. This great mass of people is scattered all over the world in their various locations. Irrespective of the enormity of the entire world population and numerous geographic areas, the prophecy of God's word concerning the end time still says that the gospel shall be preached all over the nations of the world. Looking at this goal ordinarily, the mission seems quite unrealistic and rather impossible because of the rigorous task involved in carrying out the preaching of the gospel to all nations. Yes, technological advances have helped to spread the gospel. However, the internet is censored in some nations, 
and the gospel is not allowed in those countries. Furthermore, there are places where people don't even have the internet, and there are places which are remote and difficult to reach. There are even countries where preaching the gospel is outlawed. And in those countries, the people of that nation do not even know who Jesus Christ is or what the Bible is. Therefore, Jesus' statement that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come, appears rather far-fetched. Often, God's word looks doubtful, but the truth is that God will forever be true to his word. If he has said it, yes, he will do it. Now, one thing you need to remember about God is that God has resources that you and I know absolutely nothing about. We tend to think that only missionaries and technology will be able to preach the gospel in those remote places. God's ways are higher than our ways. Let us travel into the book of Revelation to a chapter that is full of angels. In all honesty, the book of Revelation shows us a tremendous amount of angelic activity, such as the world has never seen before. For instance, the seven trumpets are sounded by seven angels, and the events that follow are described in detail from Revelation chapters 8 to 11. Revelation 9 reveals to us the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Revelation 10 reveals to us the mighty angel with a little book. In Revelation 12, we see the archangel Michael, the defender of Israel. But we're not focusing on any of these angels. We are focusing on the three angels in chapter 14. Revelation 14, verse 6 to 13. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second, followed saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Here we have something that is unusual. Here we have something that has never ever happened before. Never in the history of mankind has there been an event like this. Never in the history of mankind have angels been seen flying. Three angels fly through the sky, each of them calling out their messages. One brings the gospel and a call to worship God. The second brings an announcement of the fall of Babylon. The third warns of the wrath of God upon all who worship the beast and have his mark upon them. When the world is taking its final nosedive, and the Antichrist and the false prophet are at their most prominent, God goes to unusual lengths. God goes to lengths that he has never gone to before, to warn the world. He warns the final generation to fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and to worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. But interestingly enough, the third angel warns humanity not to take the mark of the beast. 
This third angel's announcement warns that a terrible fate awaits those who persist in worshipping the Antichrist. This angel highlights the connection between worshipping the beast and his image and receiving his mark on your forehead or on your hand. In plainer words, taking the mark of the beast will be a declaration of worship. No one will accidentally take the mark of the beast. The connection between worshipping the beast and taking the mark will be clear. We see once again God in his great grace and mercy calls sinners to repent in the final hour, or they will face the terrible judgment of the Antichrist. Those who drank the harlot's wine of the passions of her immorality will also drink the wine of the wrath of God. To drink the wine of the wrath of God is to experience his wrath. There are Bible scholars who believe that the Bible symbolically portrays these messages as being proclaimed by three angels, when in actuality it is actually God's people his last day church, who deliver these three messages to the world. However, most Bible scholars agree that the Bible talks about three angels because God will literally send three angels. There are those who argue that these three angels are three satellites or television stations, but this is incorrect. The Bible clearly states that God will clearly send three angels. If you remember earlier in the book of Revelation, John had described the innumerable host of holy angels that he saw in heaven. Now, in chapter 14, he sees one of this host flying directly overhead. Other Bible translations say that the angel is flying in mid-heaven. Mid-heaven refers to the place where the sun is at midday, its highest point. This angel is seen flying to every nation and tribe and language and people proclaiming the gospel. This first angelic being will be flying through the midst of heaven. Revelation 14.6 suggests that he will speak in English when he's over the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, and other English-speaking nations. And when he's over France, he'll speak French. Fundamentally, Revelation 14.6 suggests that this angel will address people in their own language. Jesus said in the book of Matthew 24.14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. I believe this first angel, along with the 144,000 and the two witnesses, will be God's final instrument to bring Matthew 24, 14 into fruition. The gospel will be preached into all the world. The second angel preaches the fall of Babylon. Revelation 14, 8 says, and there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. John sees another angel, a second one following after the first one who was proclaiming the eternal gospel. As much as the first angel's announcement was a proclamation of the good news of the gospel, this second angel's announcement is a declaration of the bad news of judgment. The prophecy of the second angel immediately followed that of the first. The second angel proclaimed the fall of Babylon and re-emphasized it. Understand that Babylon in this verse refers not just to the city, but also to the Antichrist's worldwide political, economic, and religious empire. Revelation 14, 9-10 says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The prophecy of the third angel followed immediately after the first and the second angel prophesied. The prophecy of the third angel is that of a warning against the worship of the Antichrist and the mark of the beast. You see, God will literally send an angel to warn the world at that time not to take the mark of the beast. Therefore, to answer the question, can you take the mark of the beast accidentally? Simply put, no. If you take the mark of the beast, 
you will know what you are getting yourself into. If you take the Mark of the Beast, you will value being able to buy and sell more than salvation. If you take the Mark of the Beast, you will have made a conscious decision not to fear God and worship, but rather to worship the Antichrist. Those who take the Mark will have made an informed decision. The Beast will have an identity, and the third angel sounded a loud warning not to receive his mark. The mark of the beast will be given either on the foreheads or on the right hands of those who worship the beast. No one will be able to say, I did not know. Those who take the mark will do so knowing fully well that they are worshiping the Antichrist and not God. God will do all he can to warn people. He will send the 144,000. He will send the two witnesses. He will send the three angels to plead with humanity not to take the mark. But one thing God will not do is impose himself on anyone. What God will not do is take away your free choice. Those who choose to not heed his warnings and decide to take the mark will do so with full knowledge of the consequences. So the third angel will fly in the heavens warning all of humanity in the kingdom of the Antichrist that if they do take the mark, the name, or the number of the name of the beast and worship him, they will seal their own destiny and be eternally destined to go to the same place that the Antichrist and the devil would dwell for eternity, the lake of fire. The prophecy of the three angels is a lesson about the lengths God goes to to keep a person out of hell. I believe just like in the book of Revelation, in every individual's life, God goes to extraordinary lengths to keep a person out of hell. I believe that in every individual's life, God sends warning after warning after warning. But people don't listen to God's warning. Look at how hard the heart of mankind will be at this time. They will literally see an angel flying in the air preaching the gospel but yet there will still be those that reject the gospel and will go ahead and take the mark of the beast. I always used to wonder, how is this even possible to see an angel flying and still reject the gospel? What more proof does a person need of the gospel message? I always used to wonder how this is even possible to see an angel flying and still reject the gospel message. John 3.19 says, The light has come into the world. But men loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. There are some people who just won't be saved. Their hearts are too hard and they hate God. Look at when God is releasing his judgments rather than repenting. The people on the earth choose to curse God. They know that God is the one sending these judgments. But rather than repenting, they blasphemy God. Revelation 16, verses 10 through 11 says, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Now we see in the book of Revelation, God will literally do everything he can short of forcing a person to warn them. God will not force you but he will present you the information. It's down to you to make the choice.